So, four live positions, four very different perspectives on this crisis tonight. And we begin here in Moscow. The use of force, President Putin declared, is a last resort. But the first shots in Moscow's occupation of Crimea have already been fired as Russian troops confronted 200 members of the Ukrainian Air Force over control of a military base. And the war of words across the Atlantic is heating up. More on that soon. The Russians cocked their rifles at the unarmed Ukrainians, firing warning shots into the air as our international editor Lindsay Hilson witnessed events unfold. She's in the Crimean capital now. Lindsay. They marched up the hill singing their regimental song. Commander Yuli Mamchor at the head of the column. These are the Ukrainian soldiers of Belbek Air Force Base, and they were demanding their planes back. As they neared the Russian troops, they broke into the Ukrainian national anthem. Even when the Russians fired warning shots in the air, the first shots of this crisis, they didn't stop marching. But they here. They just kept going, nearer and nearer, the Russians. Commander Mamchur approached the Russians. It was an extraordinary confrontation between men who were friends last week and foes today. The Russians had humiliated the Ukrainian forces and the Ukrainians weren't going to stand for it. The Russians aimed their weapons. The officers talked. The Ukrainians didn't flinch. Eventually, the tension lessened, but the standoff wasn't over. An hour later, Russian soldiers were still looking down their sights directly at the Ukrainians, now gathered at the top of the hill, waiting. Their MiG-29 fighter jets were still beyond the barbed wire under Russian control. They raised the Ukrainian flag on their barracks, a Russian soldier standing guard in front. The Ukrainian soldiers are very relaxed for such a dangerous situation. It's as if they can't really believe that their Russian brothers are training their weapons on them, but they are. Just at that moment, Commander Mamchur walked past, up to the Russians, to negotiate shared custody of the aircraft. He had given them a deadline, midday. Midday came and went. The atmosphere was relaxed. The Russians are our brothers, the Ukrainians told me. But this morning, they shot in the air and then yes, they threatened they to shoot at your but legs. I think that before, the last shoot, uh, sh shot, shots here was during the World War II. But now you heard and you see the, the shots here. It was not our shots. We are unarmed. We are without weapons. And uh, our mission here just to return the objects and uh, to provide control above them. Because this is our obligation. We can do... Um, this is the rule. Have you made a deal? <laughs> Commander Mamchur returned without a deal. He's under huge pressure, professional and personal. I'm afraid for my family. We have received threats by phone and text. Masked men appeared. Not soldiers, but irregulars. 
They formed up in front of the Russian vehicles blocking the path to the MiG fighters. But who were they? Are you soldiers or are you civilians? No comment. No comment. No comment. Understand the English language. A few yards away, Commander Mamchur was arguing with their leader. They said they were from Sevastopol and they would protect the base now. No, said Commander Mamchur. We will stay here. In the end, they reached a kind of truce. The Ukrainian soldiers marched back along the hill where they had marched this morning. They had not surrendered, but nor had the Russians. Well, while I was on that Air Force base, I spoke to one of the Ukrainian airmen, Major Sergei Gorovchansky. You used the word Russian occupation. Is it an occupation? Yeah, I think, as for me personally, it's an occupation. That is occupation. Why? Because uh, nobody asked them to help us. Nobody from militaries asked, asked them. Civilians asked Russians. Our ex-president asks asked Russians, but nobody from militaries. We do not agree, and uh, our government in Kiev, our new government in Kiev, do not agree to allow them to help us. We do not need their protection. We do not need their help. Are the Russian soldiers your comrades or your enemy? Uh, you know, I have uh, several friends here in Sevastopol from Russian army. Uh, I was born in Sevastopol. It was a Soviet Union city, so I started. Uh, I went to school during the Soviet Union in 1989, 88. Sorry, uh, and uh, after school graduation, uh, several of my s uh, school friends they went to Russian military institutes, and now they are Russians, uh, Russian uh, officers, Russian military men. Uh, we have one history with Russians. We we won. Yeah, I am personally national. My nationality is Russian. My father is Russian. What what else? What, and what do your can... family? What do your family think? <laughs> My father thinks that I am uh, fought for Kiev government. He do not agree with me. What do you think will happen now? We just wait for uh, Moscow commanders. Russian deci their decision. But have you surrendered your weapons? Where are your weapons? Uh, partly, uh, so here is not of all of our personnel here. So partly uh, our, our officers and uh, privates, they are in the barracks with weapon. And will they fight? Yes. They will? Yes. <laughs> so because, Ukrainians uh, will fight Russians? if they will fight uh, fire on us. Well, Lindsay, what is the latest at that airbase now? Well, the latest we hear is that that uneasy truce continues. The Ukrainians have not backed down, nor have the Russians. But we've just heard from one of the airmen who we met up there today that two other Air Force bases have now been occupied by the Russians. And the Ukrainians there are not backing down either. I think that when this crisis started, there was a belief, maybe on the part of the Russians, that the Ukrainian military would just agree either to hand their weapons over or just to, to work with the Russians. That's not the case at all. As far as I know, across Crimea, the Ukrainians continue to hold out. They will not surrender to the Russians. For now, thanks, Lindsay Hilsom in Crimea. Well,